Good afternoon, everyone. As I'm sure you will all know by now, the Court of Justice of the European Union yesterday held that Privacy Shield was invalid, but importantly, that standard contractual clauses remained valid. However, controllers had to assess their use on a case by case basis, with regulators charged with policing that assessment. Welcome to the latest Phil Fisher's Privacy Webinar series. My name is Renzo Marchini and I'm a partner in the Privacy Practice in London. Thank you so much for joining us. A special hello to those of you who have dialed in from the Enterprise Cloud Privacy Group, ECPG in California. You're very welcome. I know it's early there. Whilst the headline is clear, there was much in the judgment yesterday to unpick. And in the admittedly very short time available since it was published yesterday morning, we've done our best to analyze the issues thrown up and try to offer some practical tips and solutions about how to manage and navigate those issues. Our main focus will be on some standard scenarios and the impact of the judgment upon them. We will finish within the hour, that is at five o'clock London time. Before we come on to the substance, I have a few points about us and also a few house, housekeeping points about the webinar. For those of you that do not already know us, Phil Fisher is an international law firm with offices across Europe in Silicon Valley and in China. Our privacy team works across all of those offices and we are a collaborative team providing strategic and actionable privacy solutions. Turn to housekeeping, please do ask us questions using the question function on your screen. We'll try and take them at convenient points, perhaps throughout, we left some time at the end also. Next week, we'll send you a copy of our slides and indeed even a link to a recording. So there's no need to make copious notes as we go along. This is an important topic and we correctly anticipated much interest and demand. So we're in fact repeating this on Monday at 10 o'clock. If you have colleagues that would like to join and couldn't make it today, please do let them know. A couple of other points. Do please subscribe to our blog, which has a regular set of posts on topical issues. Our initial thoughts were posted yesterday on Schrems 2, and I'm sure there'll be more on Schrems impact and, 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 and fallout um, to follow. And do keep an eye also for more of our webinars over the coming weeks and months. So um, the structure of the session, first of all, introductions. Uh, on the right is, is not me, it's Mr. Schrems. Uh, he's not with us today, but I am joined by two of my colleagues, Eleanor Dews, who's a director in our team, uh, before joining us, she was a UK government lawyer. She was, in fact, the lead UK lawyer in the negotiations of the GDPR leading up to adoption in 2016. After those GDPR uh, negotiations, she became a senior lawyer in the Department for Exiting the EU, working on both the UK domestic Brexit legislation and the EU-UK withdrawal agreement. We're also joined by Michael Brown, a senior associate in our team. He has spent time in our Silicon Valley office and is especially knowledgeable about challenges that our US clients face in navigating international data flow issues. So the main structure of today's talk then is, first of all, I will introduce by, uh, a bit of the background leading up to Schrems 2. Um, for some of you, I know this will be incredibly familiar, but as always these things, it's good to set some baselines and some of you will have read some of the Frank frankly hyperbole over the last 24 hours, worrying and maybe don't know quite a lot of the terms that are used. So I'll try and set them out in, this, in a succinct manner as possible. Um, we'll then turn to Michael Brown, who will summarize the judgment for us um, and the key takeaways from it. Um, Eleanor will elucidate some of the early um, views of stakeholders, some of them just about two hours ago, um, so of uh, regulators, um, and then the meat of the session, which is in a, as practical a way as we can to apply the judgment to common data transfer scenarios and sum it up with some suggested next steps for business. So then, um, set the, the, the scene and background. The EU has rules on sending data out of the EU. The, the reason for that is because the EU treats privacy treats data protection as a fundamental right. It's in the Charter of the Fundamental Right of the European Union, Article 7, the right to privacy, Article 8, the right of data protection. And those protections should not be lost by controllers in the EU sending data out of the EU. 
So how can we use, how can people assure that the data, uh, the, the, the protections are not lost? The two main mechanisms, adequacy and appropriate safeguards, which I'll talk about, and a third, not really a mechanism, but an exception, derogations, which may become important for some of you in navigating the outcome of the court decision. So adequacy then is when the European Commission looks at the laws in a particular country or particular sector within a particular country and says, if those laws in that country or sector uh, apply to you, then data can flow to you because the data is protected, adequately protected, or to use language that's becoming very common now in the CJEU cases, insurance one and insurance two, essentially equivalent protection. Um, Privacy Shield is part of and is part of the adequacy landscape. It's a sector specific one. If you've signed up to Privacy Shield, then until yesterday, you were adequate. So I'm taking that off the list. Uh, at the bottom of the list, we have the UK and the UK making public pronouncements that it wants post Brexit to be treated as an adequate country. And that is still subject to the trade negotiations. So the regime in GDPR involves, first of all, yeah, a, a question, are, are, is your recipient in an adequate country? Well, we know now no one in the US will ever be. But if not, can you put in place appropriate safeguards? And the two main ways of assuring appropriate safeguards are on the screen in front of you now. First of all, standard contractual clauses, which were, of course, part of the decision yesterday. Um, standard forms of documents issued by the European Commission, um, which if you sign them, then you, it's supposed to give, uh, give rise to an appropriate safeguard. You've contractually protected the data. And again, I want to mention here, we'll reiterate a few times, um, they have not been declared invalid. They have not been declared invalid even for transfers to the US. Um, the second main scheme on, of appropriate safeguards are so-called binding corporate rules. And this is when an international group will set out its policies and procedures for handling data, implement them throughout the group internationally, everywhere they operate, not just in the EU, and get those policies and procedures approved by the regulators in Europe. Um, very few companies do this. It's not an immediate fix to any of the problems that have been thrown up by yesterday's ruling because of the very long approval process, which I'm afraid is getting longer and longer as underfunded, understaffed regulators struggle to meet the demand. Um, I think it's only been a handful that have been approved under the new GDPR regime, although there was a hundred plus issued before GDPR. And lastly, and I know that Michael's going to come back to this in, in one or two of the scenarios that we're going to be talking about, it is possible that transfers can happen subject to a derogation. You know, this is an acceptance that the data will not be uh, in an adequate country, will not be appropriately safeguarded, but nonetheless you can continue because it's an exception. The most important one for present purpose, the most important two, are explicit consent perhaps or performance of a contract. Um, I want to quickly just whiz through the timeline of how we got to yesterday's decision. Um, you know, what, 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 why Facebook? Why Ireland? Um, this all happened, all started because of the, the, the disclosures by Edward Snowden back in 2013 regarding the NSA and other agencies' access to tech data, uh, tech possessed data um, in the US, um, and Facebook's data being involved in that. Um, Mr. Schrems is or was a Facebook user um, and, uh, and Facebook in Europe then and as is now um, are headquartered in Ireland and therefore Ireland is the relevant jurisdiction to use GDPR terminology, although this is pre-GDPR, um, the lead authority was the Irish Data Protection Commissioner. He complained to the Irish DPC that Facebook European data was going to the Facebook Inc in the States and the DPC refused to enforce against it, saying, well, we can't because Safe Harbor has been approved by the European Commission, recognized by legislation, and therefore um, there can be no complaint about that transfer. Uh, we're really cutting long story short. In October 2015, 
CGAU's Court of Justice European Union in Shren Swan invalidated safe harbor. Um, and those of you that were practicing privacy like me in those days will remember a massive flurry of activity with thousands of safe harbor rights sending out standard contractual clauses to its European customer base, the European customers base. Um, a lot of them preempted it, had it ready to go, pressed, pressed the green button um, and, uh, and, and papered over the, the failure of safe harbor. And I'm sure we'll see some of that um, now as a result of Privacy Shield. Um, but Facebook then said, well, hey, okay, well, data can still go to the US because I'm now relying on, we're now relying on standard contractual clauses, the second uh, mechanism, uh, uh, appropriate safeguards. Um, so there was a second complaint to the Irish DPC in relation to standard contractual clauses, and that's what ended up, again, via the courts and a reference to the European courts because it's a European issue, not just an Irish issue, an issue of interpretation of um, European legislation rather than simply Irish legislation, which is why it ends up these cases in, in European courts. Um, yes, it is judgment. In the meantime, we had Privacy Shield come in in 2016 uh, to replace Safe Harbor. It, it, it wasn't just cobbled together in a, in a hurry, although it might look like that to some people. It was in any case Safe Harbor in the process of being replaced because of some long-standing criticism of it. And of course, in the meantime, also in May 2018, we had GDPR come into force. Um, and, and that's important to mention is that all the facts that Mr. Schrems is complaining about, and although they're still continuing, his complaints you know, uh, were all pre-GDPR, but the law and the important parts of the law don't remain, it didn't change with GDPR. And the court, in fact, was, was at pain yesterday to, to say the, the analysis would be the same under the old law and under GDPR. Um, so just a little technical point there for, 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 for the lawyers amongst us. As I say, so yesterday we had the judgment, uh, which Michael will now take us through. Thank you, Michael, over to you. Thanks, Renzo. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yeah, we can. Great. Uh, so good afternoon everyone or good morning to those who are dialing in from the US. I know there are a lot of webinars and commentary on this topic at the moment uh, so we appreciate your, your time and attention. So to my mind Schrems 1 and Schrems 2 seems analogous to a blockbuster film in its sequel. In the first case or film there was a central plot namely the tension between US surveillance rules and EU fundamental rights and there was, of course, the passing of a major protagonist in the form of the safe harbor framework. In the second case or sequel, that central plot is revisited. There's the passing of another protagonist in the form of Privacy Shield, but crucially, another character, standard contractual clauses, survives, but needs to develop and grow into a more prominent figure. You can move to the next slide, please, Renzo. So on the standard contractual clauses, yesterday the court followed the opinion of the Advocate General and concluded that they remain a valid mechanism for exporting data from Europe to outside of Europe. However, crucially, the court ruled that there will be circumstances where the SECs alone uh, might not be sufficient to satisfy EU data transfer requirements. What are those circumstances? Uh, well, the judgment sets out that where the law of a third country allows its public authorities to interfere with the rights of EU individuals. So in short, local surveillance requirements. The court then set out what organisations need to do in practice in order to rely on the standard contractual clauses. Um, first, the controller must verify um, on a case-by-case -case basis the laws of the third country to ensure the recipient can comply with the SECs or whether additional safeguards will be required. If that test is passed, then the SECs can be signed and the transfer can take place. If that test is failed, then the parties would need to um, put in place so-called supplementary measures to ensure the data is protected in line with the standard contractual clauses. Note there's reference in the judgment to supplementary measures, additional measures and additional safeguards, which um, do seem to be the same concept, 
um, but we await kind of further guidance on, on that point. From now on, we'll just refer to um, additional safeguards in the rest of the webinar. If it is possible to implement additional safeguards, um, the standard contractual clauses can be signed and the transfers can take place. If it's not possible, uh, standard contractual clauses should not be signed um, and the transfer shouldn't take place um, in the view of the court. That's our kind of general extrapolation of um, the, the position set out in, in the judgment. In addition, the court reminded data exporters and data importers of existing obligations um, under the, the SCCs. These include that the processor must notify the controller if it's unable to comply with the provisions, um, and the controller must suspend or terminate the transfer if the recipient is unable to comply with the standard contractual clauses. Finally, the Court of Justice of the European Union provides scope for supervisory authorities to, to intervene and police the transfers in the event of, of non-compliance. Could you move to the next slide, please, Renzo? So with that in mind, we've, we've outlined four key implications of, of the court's judgment. First, the court seems to be giving real effect to the SEC um, provisions. There's a school of thought that, that some organizations may have used uh, standard contractual clauses, a box ticking exercise, signed the document, filed it away um, without potentially um, putting the, the provisions into practice. TREMS2 does seem to counter that approach um, and the court seems to expect companies to live up to their standard contractual clause responsibilities as well as inviting DPAs to regulate the topic more closely. That said, historically there's there's been little um, significant enforcement action from, from EU DPAs in relation to data transfers or notwithstanding Mr. Mr. Schrems, uh, complaints from individuals. We'll have to see whether that will change, uh, given, as Renzo mentioned, the, the resource constraints on DPAs and obviously kind of broader concerns around um, and the, the, the state of uh, things due to, to COVID-19 um, and, and kind of public priorities. Uh, Eleanor will provide more insight on, on the immediate reactions of, of DPAs and other stakeholders. Second implication um, is the concept of, of a verification process, uh, which will be new to, to many controllers. And unsurprisingly, um, controllers may be slightly confused and find it onerous that they have to verify the surveillance laws of a third country. However, and this, this is just some of our kind of initial thinking um, uh, amongst the, the the, the presenters of this webinar, pending guidance from regulators, that it may well be that there are kind of three elements um, to this verification process. So first, uh, considering whether the organization receiving the data is actually subject to uh, local surveillance laws. Second, consider the types of processing activities undertaken since obviously vanilla HR processing is, is different compared to say processing of, of criminal background checks or, or health data. And then third, Article 45.2 of the GDPR um, actually sets out the factors that the European Commission must consider in terms of determining adequacy. Um, and I expect those factors could potentially be instructive as, as part of this verification process. So in practice, what might emerge is a kind of pseudo uh, data transfer assessment, which will become part of organization's accountability program, uh, much the same way as a legitimate interest assessment or a DPIA. Um, and in practice, expect that uh, controllers um, will ask uh, processors to, to assist with this process. Third implication, um, additional safeguards, which again will be a new concept, and Eleanor, Eleanor and I will address that in more detail in the scenarios. Um, but again, we've 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 put our heads together and come up with uh, three different areas in terms of additional safeguards. Um, so one, technical. So can uh, 
the processor encrypt the data or apply other security protections so that it's not subject or accessible to law enforcement authorities. Um, so a kind of technical uh, safeguard. Two, contractual. So do you currently have requirements on uh, processors that they'll comply with law enforcement requests? Um, it, it, is it broadly worded or, or is the requirement missing? If, if so, you may need to, to consider tightening that up so that compulsion um, it, or disclosure happens when it's when it's really kind of strictly strictly required. Uh, third potential area of additional safeguards are, are kind of policies. So do you as a processor have a law enforcement request policy which might um, provide comfort to controllers around the steps you'd take in the event of um, a request or um, access to data under surveillance requirements? So this seems like one of the most pivotal practical aspects of the judgment and I'm sure there'll be um, a lot of brain power going into identifying additional safeguards and it does seem as though the court has has left this open as an option for four organizations um, otherwise it, it, it would have been absent from the judgment so so lots to kind of think about in, in that area fourth I yes. think Michael Sorry to, yes. sorry to interrupt, just to, just to re-emphasize that point, I mean, that's something in my first reading which, which struck me was that the standard contractual clauses, yeah, for use in the US, and I know we're going to come back to it in one of your scenarios, Eleanor, um, could have been declared unlawful, but were not. They were not. They did leave open this kink or this, this room for additional safeguards, and I know we're going to come back to it. It's such an important point. I don't think we can, we, we can overemphasize it. Michael, sorry to interrupt you, carry on. No, not at all, Renzo. I mean, I think that chimes with the whole general sense of living up to standard contractual clauses in, in practice and, and potentially it not being a box ticking exercise anymore. And, and having those kind of additional safeguards mean that there might be some element of, of kind of tailored standard contractual clauses kind of going forward. Um, so for, um, there will likely be some kind of commercial friction and uncertainty arising from the from the judgment, um, but pending comments from regulators, and I know they're coming in thick and fast, um, standard contractual clauses are likely to be used in some shape or form. And so I think suppliers can expect customers to, to request them if, if they've been relying on Privacy Shield previously, and also customers can expect suppliers to, to provide um, standard contractual clauses to, to plug the gap which has emerged from, from yesterday's judgment. Uh, so suppliers will likely need to be alive to assisting with um, those types of requests and, and just more generally uh, with one, that verification process that I talked about and two, the kind of additional safeguards piece. Uh, and then last but not least, I'm, I'm sure we all eagerly await the new standard contractual clauses from the European Commission. If, if you could move on to the next slide, please, Renzo. Thanks very much. So on Privacy Shield, the court went further than the AG opinion and deemed uh, the adequacy decision to be invalid. This was on the basis that the US does not ensure an adequate level of protection for personal data, which is, and this is the key phrase that, that Renzo mentioned earlier, essentially equivalent to that guaranteed in the EU. Uh, the judgment reads as though the court actually performed its own adequacy assessment, um, what, similar to what I was talking about in terms of Article 45.2 of the GDPR. So having a kind of checklist on the left-hand side of, of that Article 45.2 criteria, um, and then on the right-hand side, having elements of uh, US surveillance legislation and seeing how they, they stacked up and, and whether there could be essentially equivalent um, protection. A number of points were, were picked out by, by the court, um, and I'll just um, pinpoint a few uh, that were indicated as, as, as not being essentially, or indicating a lack of essential equivalence. So one, EU individuals don't have an actionable right before the courts against US authorities. Uh, two, that, that mass surveillance is, is not limited to what's strictly necessary. And then three, there was a fair bit of comment on, on concerns around the ombudsperson, 
mechanism. So the individual appointed on the, the privacy shield, uh, the court questioned whether the individual was sufficiently independent from the executive, um, and also whether the mechanism actually provided a, a cause of action for EU individuals. So if you could move on to the next slide, please, Renzo. Uh, so four implications um, from, from the privacy shield decision. So uh, there's, it's no longer a, a valid mechanism for, for transferring data from, from the EU to the US. Um, that said, we're, we're kind of 36 hours on from, from the judgment and organizations will have made contractual commitments to process in line with the privacy shield. So I think it's, it's kind of sensible to, to continue with, with those and to continue to process in line with the privacy shield. Um, and the US Department of Commerce has, has issued comment to, to that effect as, as Eleanor will, will touch upon. Um, second, obviously makes sense to start considering your alternative options in, in view of your, your data transfer flows. So potentially worth dusting off the Article 30 records that you have to, to see um, what might need to be plugged where Privacy Shield was relied upon. Also consider the fact that um, under Privacy Shield, the data transfer mechanism was, was neutral as to whether um, the US recipient was a controller or a processor. Um, obviously, that's not the case under uh, model clauses. So controller to controller and controller to processor or controller to processor clauses may need to be put in place. Uh, how best to roll those out? Um, similar analysis applies as following safe harbor invalidation and also in relation to the GDPR. I expect there'll be a different ranges of approach across the market depending on risk tolerance, but I think we'll expect, we'll likely see incorporation of standard contractual clauses, um, kind of pre-signed documentation, uh, click and accept, um, and obviously taking into account though that there does need to be some element of, or potentially verification process and, and additional safeguards now on top of that. Third, uh, Michael, sorry, just on that, we had yes. a question just, just exactly at that point. Uh, forgive me, those people that asked earlier questions, we will come back to them uh, at an appropriate time. But the question, you almost answered it, can SECs be signed electronically, uh, for example, with DocuSign? Uh, so th the short answer is, I think there's, there's a spectrum of compliance, isn't there? I mean, if the more robust end of the spectrum would be that uh, you'd, you'd have it in a kind of ink signature, but but that's unlikely to be practical yeah. Um, yeah. Or, or kind of feasible for most organizations. And, and so the moving along the, the kind of more uh, or less conservative uh, end of the spectrum, having DocuSign executed clauses yeah. tends to be generally fine, doesn't it, Renzo, for, yeah, for exactly. most organizations? And, and, and it's exactly what people did after Safe Harbor died. There was lots of electronic signatures going on um, and click here and, and people still do that now. If you know, click here to, to be subject to our EU facing DPA. Exactly. It's a, yeah. it's a kind of scalable approach. Yeah. Uh, third implication, and, and nearly wrapping up, and then I'll hand over to Eleanor. So, third implication is that there will be a documentation which makes reference to privacy shields. So, notices, policies, contracts, uh, amendments to those will likely be required in due or will be required in due course. And then, fourth, what um, potential for EU US adequacy 3.0. Uh, that's the kind of million dollar question. On the one hand, I think we can expect quite a lot of commercial will and, and potentially political will to, to get a, a deal done. But obviously it will be subject to, to a number of different obstacles. One, market acceptance given um, the fall of Safe Harbor and, and, and kind of privacy shield would um, an organization sign up to, to a new a new deal given it's another invalidation. Um, two, the CGAU has shown itself to be a, a pro-privacy court. Um, and so query whether an adequacy deal could could get done which which would then withstand um, uh, scrutiny of the court uh, without changes to US surveillance rules. But Obviously, as I say, there's there's there is a willpower and a, and a and a consciousness that EU and Europe need to do business. So uh, uncertain, but but we shall see. With that, I'll, I'll handle. 
Uh, sorry, yeah, I'll hand over in a moment. Yeah. Um, if, there, if there was an adequacy 2.0, there will inevitably be a, Shem, a Schrems 3 to, to extend your movie analogy. It, it will be a trilogy back, in, <laughs> back here in 2025. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I'm trying to think of great movie trilogies. I think, yeah, Godfather 2 is more explosive than Godfather 1. I can't quite remember Godfather 3, but yeah. Over well, to Eleanor. Thank you, Michael. Pass back over to Eleanor, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael and Renzo, and hello, everyone. So every great blockbuster gets the critics very excited, and uh, this one is no different. So I'm going to run through what some of the stakeholders have been saying in the last 24 hours or so about the Schrems 2 judgment. Next slide, please, Renzo. So firstly, the European Commission really, really keen to emphasize in its press statement that transatlantic data flows can continue. So that was pretty much right at the start of what they said. Um, and it's also very apparent that there have been ongoing conversations between the European Commission and the US for some time. They've seen this coming and they mentioned a substitute for Privacy Shield a strengthened and durable transfer mechanism. So some, I think, calm spread around by the European Commission. You can continue your, um, your data flows from the EU and the UK to the US. As Renzo said, uh, the court did not say that that wasn't possible. So those can still continue. That is the message to hang on to. So next slide, please. And the US Department of Commerce, um, similar, it says it will continue to administer the Privacy Shield program, so it's not giving up on this at all. Uh, the submissions for self-certification and recertification will continue as before, and the Department of Commerce was really keen to emphasise that what's happened with the court does not relieve your uh, organisations who are participating in Privacy Shield from their obligations. So if you're subject to Privacy Shield, you are still going to need to comply with those principles as before. Next slide, please, Renzo. And um, the Information Commissioner's Office in the UK, what did they say? Well, I think this is quite interesting from a Brexit perspective as well, because of course the UK is set shortly to um, re-emerge, I think, as Boris Johnson would uh, say it, on the world stage. And the ICO's reflections, I think, show just how important that is. So one of the first things they said was uh, data transfers are vital for the global economy. So looking at that um, post-Brexit transition period, uh, UK commerce, they were also not going to come down hard on UK organisations. So they said, we are there to support UK organisations um, after this judgment. So I don't think that we're going to see an awful lot of regulatory action, um, certainly any sort of problems coming out with the regulator saying you can't transfer data. That's simply not going to happen. The ICO is not keen to do that at all. And then it emphasised again, global data flows must continue um, but of course, personal data has to be protected. So a real push there on ensuring that the global economy, particularly in the COVID context, can still continue to function. And last but not least, they did also say, if you are currently using Privacy Shield, you should continue to do so. So for your data flows, particularly I'd say from the UK to the US, Privacy Shield is still there. They said, wait for the guidance, but don't, if you're using it, do anything different until we have posted some more information about this. So interesting on that. Next slide, please, Renzo. So the Data Protection Commission in Ireland. Um, the Data Protection Commissioner came under a huge amount of pressure and I think was subject to quite a lot of criticism for having um, brought these cases to the Court of Justice uh, in, in the first place. And uh, so the first thing they wanted to emphasise uh, was that this had been the right thing to do. So they said um, that the court firmly endorses the DPC. So, uh, so um, a bit of a bit of a emphasis on 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 the righteousness of their cause, as it were. Um, and then um, a slightly different tone, as I said, critics don't always agree, and we've got the same issue here. They said in terms of the application of um, SCCs for transfers to the US. They did say that's now 
questionable. But again, we must emphasize that the court did not say that you cannot use SCCs to transfer data to the US. Um, and of course, the DPC, again, um, is examining uh, the judgment carefully. That's what they said. Uh, and they said, obviously, as Michael uh, was mentioning, you've got to look at the uh, safeguards that you've got in place on a case by case basis. And then next slide, please, Renzo. The final reaction, um, this came out just very, very recently, I think just a couple of hours ago or so. This is from the Berlin um, Commissioner for Data Protection. So a different reaction here. Um, and we must emphasize that this is not a regulator suspending data flows. It is simply a press release. So I think people have slightly overreacted here. Um, don't worry, it was just a press release, and the but the Berlin Commissioner for Data Protection did say stop sending data to the US and onshore everything now. Um, others are not saying that, of course, and, and we've seen a selection of what others are saying. Um, but again, to emphasize, don't worry at this stage too much about this press release. So there are some of the reactions. Um, next slide, please, Renzo. So we said at the beginning that we're going to apply the judgment now to some practical scenarios. So here's the first one. Um, you've got an EU or UK controller sending data to a US processor under standard contractual clauses. Uh, and just to recap, um, what has the court said about what you need to achieve in this context? Well, they're, they're essentially saying that the data has to be protected to the same standards as if it were still in the EU. So the level of protection of the GDPR should not be undermined, they said, and the standards of protection should be essentially equivalent. Uh, that, uh, we think, is not a particularly pragmatic view, uh, but nonetheless, that's what they've said, and so steps will need to be taken. So I'll take you through, on a practical level, how you do essentially um, what the judgment says, perhaps without uh, following it entirely, because as I say, this is not really a pragmatic uh, pronouncement on the realities of things. So next slide, please, Renzo. So if you're using the standard contractual clauses in this scenario, um, as Michael mentioned, the first thing you need to look at is the verification process. So you're looking there at the legislation um, in the third country, in this case, the US. And if you don't pass the verification test, so your little mini adequacy um, assessment suggests that the data will not be protected to the standard that it would be in Europe, then you need to move on to your additional safeguards. So I'm going to unpack for you now a little bit more about what those additional safeguards might look like in practice. Next slide, please, Renzo. Eleanor, before we do that, so there's a question or two about the actual verification process that came in, I thought also when Michael was uh, uh, summarising the judgment. Um, yes. I, I know it's early days and it's difficult, but you know, for example, uh, you know, how do you do it? Is it country by country, company by company? You've got many recipients in the US, do you do it on a company by company basis, uh, data by data basis? Do we have, we, we clearly don't have any guidance on that yet. What are your initial thoughts? So my initial thoughts are that really the court did point specifically towards, um, firstly, the, the concept of are there judicial remedies there for the data subject um, and uh, what sort of safeguards are there? And it pointed then towards this list in Article 45.2 of the GDPR, which sets out a whole host of things, which quite frankly, I don't know how um, anyone who um, isn't specialist in legislation in a particular jurisdiction could answer because it's things like what is the legal framework in that jurisdiction yeah. uh, what is the national security legislation yeah. so if you're being pointed to that list then i think that probably applies whether you're looking at a company because the company yeah. obviously will be within a jurisdiction um or looking sort of more you know generally so are you looking at a privacy shield type situation or yeah. a a whole country adequacy decision and it it's, looks like the factors are the same at the moment of course we don't we haven't got much does. guidance if any it so. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crying up indeed it's crying up for guidance isn't it yes, and it's crying it and, and you know uh, it's hopeful that you know some of the, the the regulators might 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 issue some as to how to sensibly do it it, it, it is a ludicrous position to have hundreds of thousands of european companies 
try to assess whether the laws of, it's not just pick on the US, but the laws of India um, or elsewhere are or are not providing essentially equivalent standards. So it's crying out for, for guidance. It, it also reminds me, those of you in the UK might remember um, the old law when we had an eighth data protection principle and guidance from the UK ICO on sending data without standard contractual clauses if you could assure yourself that it was appropriately protected by examining the laws in that country. Um, but anyway, I'm, I've taken up too much time on that point. Um, I, I hope that's answered the question for the person that's asked it. Um, do please move on. Yeah, it's a very good question. Right, so let's unpack the additional safeguards a little bit. Um, so you need to be looking here um, case by case. Um, and we were just talking about whether things are realistic. Um, I mean, that isn't really on a sort of individual transfer basis. You're going to have to look at the particular categories of data you've got. So Michael mentioned earlier, in terms of risk assessment, for example, is it simply anodyne data, HR data perhaps, that wouldn't really be of any interest uh, to an intelligence agency, for example. So have a look at the sort of data that you've got. Is it high risk or not? Um, and Mike also mentioned uh, some of the technical measures that you could take. So possibly encryption might be quite a useful one, but only, of course, if your business is such that encryption works for you, because for a lot of data that um, gets sent to the US, you know, you'll be looking at it from the perspective of developing um, AI, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and so the actual data itself will be a really important part of your business and encryption just won't work. So again, it's case by case. Are you subject to Pfizer 702 or Executive Order 12333? If you're not, uh, then obviously uh, the data is less at risk uh, and you haven't got the problems which are surfaced in this judgment. Um, but a lot of you will be, we know, um, and so that is an issue. And then Michael was mentioning about the policies. So an example might be the recipient's um, policy in relation to law enforcement queries. Is it uh, pretty strict? And do they tend not to comply insofar as they can say, you know, no, we need a court order or something like that? Or are they fairly uh, relaxed about it and they tend to hand, hand the data over uh, when they're asked. Um, if, if they are relaxed, then perhaps tightening that up a bit might be a way in which you could apply additional safeguards in this particular context. And the final bullet point, just to say, um, this isn't just about the controller to processor standard contractual clauses. Obviously, that was the focus of the judgment, but this applies, we think, right across the different configurations of standard contractual clauses. So it would also apply this, this uh, process to a controller to controller standard contractual clauses relationship as well. Um, next slide, please, Renzo. So handing back to Michael now to look at this second scenario. Thanks, Eleanor. And I think I can deal with uh, scenario two quite quickly. Uh, so this relates to where an EU or UK controller um, may have been disclosing uh, personal or transferring personal data to, to a US uh, controller or processor under the privacy shield. So clearly can't rely um, uh, on privacy shield in, in the kind of medium to, to long term, notwithstanding the, the points made by Eleanor about uh, some some kind of form of grace period being, being commented on by some regulators. Uh, so going forward, you need an alternative, and, and the logical one is of course standard contractual clauses um, with uh, the, the conditions around kind of verification and, and implementation of, of additional safeguards. Renzo, could you move to the next scenario, please? Uh, before that, Michael, sorry, um, there was a, bit yep. a question here which I think is pertinent. A lot of people will be having it. You know, is there a grace period here? Uh, good question. I mean, I, I don't think the, the phrase grace period has been used by the regulators yet. Um, if, we, if we look back at what happened in relation to Safe Harbour, there was a kind of de facto grace period. Um, and, and that was the, the general position yeah. taken by the regulators. I think from, from what Eleanor mentioned um, earlier, it seems as though some regulators are saying, yes, yeah. There's, yeah. there's a great period. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Cool. Uh, so scenario three is a bit more of a niche uh, data transfer scenario whereby um, 
you've got an EU or UK individual uh, whose data is being transferred to, to a US controller under Privacy Shield. So that would be where um, you've got a US business um, providing goods or services to, to an EU uh, consumer. Uh, so that was, in that instance, you don't have a data exporter um, in the EU with whom to enter into to standard contractual clauses um, with the US controller. So, so how do you solve that? Because it was previously uh, remedied by Privacy Shield. Um, potentially, you look at some of the derogations. Uh, so, contractual performance was was mentioned by Renzo. Um, query whether that kind of derogation might cover processing activities such as um, machine learning or, or AI or analytics being being done by by the US business. That that some of it might. So, there might be room to maneuver there. Uh, Another derogation, explicit consent of, of the individual. Um, according to the DPAs, that, that would need to be um, a kind of one-off and, and non-systematic to fit within the derogation. But it, it is a, a, a potential consideration or, or an option if in, in, in kind of one-off scenarios, just, just raise the fact that it would need to be to kind of GDPR standard and, and practically there's there's difficulties um, in the event that the consent was, is withdrawn. It remains an option which organizations could consider. Alternatively, and this is a bit more of a kind of creative, pragmatic solution, and, and, and hopefully where some of the market might move with, with these kind of issues, is potentially to, to incorporate some kind of standard contractual clause style provisions into the terms of service with the individual, um, either in full or, or by reference. Um, and, and basically putting the individual in the position of the data exporter and, and the US business saying, listen, we'll we'll live up to the expectations under um, the SECs um, and, and process your data to, to kind of GDPR standards. So that's that's one kind of slightly different solution which which might emerge, um, which might demonstrate a bit more of a, a pragmatic approach. I'll hand back over to Eleanor to, to move on with the next scenario. Thanks very much, Michael. So the next scenario we've got um, is an EU or UK controller sending to a processor understanding contractual clauses to a different part of the world. So not the US now, but any um, other country, any third country as the EU calls it. So uh, what are you going to have to do? What are the practical steps? Well, firstly, there's that verification that we talked about, that mini data transfer assessment, which um, is going to be quite challenging but hopefully we will have guidance soon on that um, and then if your third country doesn't pass that verification test then you need your additional safeguards so again it's looking case by case at uh, the categories of data essentially that you're transferring um, is it fairly anodyne um, do a risk assessment of that uh, what's likely to happen um, if the data is accessed if it's vanilla data, it might not really make that much difference. Um, but these are the sort of things you need to be thinking about. Could you encrypt it, as we talked about before? Uh, so technical measures to, um, to safeguard the data. Um, and again, looking at the recipient's law enforcement policy, can that be tightened up a little bit so that they're not just simply handing the data over at the first request, um, but waiting until they are actually compelled to do so? And in the most extreme scenarios, and we think this would be very, very rare indeed, perhaps only apply to um, China, for example, if you cannot provide additional safeguards which um, satisfy the uh, a test, then you may need to think about onshoring the data. But we think that really is going to be the exception. Next scenario, please, Renzo. So the next scenario um, relates to Brexit and after the Brexit um, transition period. So we've got an EU controller sending to a UK processor, processor after the 31st of December of this year, which is when we think this transition period will expire. EU law will no longer regulate the UK. Uh, what happens there? Because the UK becomes a third country for the purposes of data transfers. The UK is very much hoping, as Renzo uh, mentioned at the beginning, for 
an EU adequacy assessment, uh, which is positive. So, so the UK will be the recipient of that EU adequacy decision and data will continue to flow freely. But if the UK doesn't get adequacy, what happens then? Um, so SCCs are likely to be the most usual transfer mechanism that you'd look at in that situation. Um, and you do, do your verification test. Now, if the UK had not got adequacy for a particular reason, for example, it's national security legislation or something like that, um, then you would need those additional safeguards. But look closely at what the EU said when they didn't award the UK adequacy. Um, what additional safeguards might be able to deal with that particular situation? Um, and also, what's the UK saying about the safeguards? So if it's saying, oh, we're about to amend our national security legislation and it won't apply to most data that's sent from the EU, then you ought to be able to rely on the SCCs. I think that's the bottom line is that we don't think this is going to be a problem. It might be a bit of extra uh, bureaucracy, a bit of extra um, consideration, a bit of extra form filling and risk management, but we think you'll be fine. So um, what's the way around this? There is likely to be one, but you do need to consider that. And final scenario slide, please, Renzo. So um, finally, uh, if you've got a UK controller uh, sending to an EU processor after the Brexit transition period, so after the end of this year, what happens then? Well, the UK has said that the EU is going to be adequate for transfers from the UK to the EU uh, until the end of 2024. Um, but during these few years um, that remain until then, uh, the UK is going to be assessing the EU for adequacy. So that's going to be very interesting because there is a lot of talk about the fact that the EU countries themselves might not be particularly good on their checks and balances in relation to data protect, uh, sorry, national security legislation. Um, but, uh, but the Commission and the Court of Justice are not allowed to look at the member states' national security legislation. So there's a little interesting irony there, actually, at the heart of this case. Next slide, please. So what should you be looking out for in the next few weeks and months? Um, well, the messaging from the data protection authorities is really important. Um, are they granting, as the ICO is doing, something of a grace period, or are they taking a slightly harder line? And I think what's going to be really crucial is guidance from the EDPB, because you wouldn't expect to see, the whole idea of the GDPR is harmonisation, so you wouldn't expect to see all the regulators taking different action in relation to this, you would expect this all to be coordinated at EDPB level. So watch out for guidance from the EDPB. And we know that there are new standard contractual clauses on the way from the European Commission. And I would expect those to come relatively soon. We understand that they are more or less drafted. So look out for those as well. On and on that, Eleanor, a couple of a couple a couple of questions on standard contractual clauses that came in, which are very pertinent to that. One one was um, a processor sending data from the UK to the EU, or or indeed could be vice versa. I'm trying to read it. Um, currently, there is no processor to control a standard contractual clauses, so it's irrelevant to Brexit. It's a it's a hole in the armory, as is processor to in the EU to sub processor out of the EU a hole in the armory, the new sets are expected to deal with those sorts of scenarios which are not yet covered. That's true, isn't it? That's right. We expect them to be modular so that they should be able to cover any configuration of um, controller, processor, sub-processor, whatever your configuration, we expect that the new standard contractual clauses will be able to deal with that. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, so it's back to me then, just to, to finish off. We might not have time for any more questions, but I've asked a few. But in, in the last five minutes, then, I just want to really draw some of the thoughts and uh, points together that we've covered uh, so far. Uh, and split it to two slides, one for, you know, if privacy shield was the mechanic of choice uh, up to now, and the second slide is um, if standard contractual clauses were the mechanic of choice. So you know, if you are someone that is in Privacy Shield or was in Privacy Shield, well, it still exists, the US authorities have said it still exists, then as Michael said, you, you, can, you, you might and will want to be 
proactively offering standard contractual clauses um, to your corporate customers. Um, and see the next slide, which I'll come to in relation to what that means, i.e. the SEC issues. Um, you might want to think about DocuSign offering click wrap solutions to it, um, in incorporating contracts by reference rather than just by wet ink. If anyone uses wet ink these days, if you deal directly with consumers, can you unilaterally declare the SECs in, in some way? Although there's no actual exporter of the data, uh, maybe the best that you can do is to issue by deed or some form of document, some, some form of binding mechanism, a promise to individuals essentially equivalent to the SECs. You might be able to rely on, on, on derogation, although we had a couple of queries um, uh, on, on the questions about whether that really does you know, ever really apply. Yes, there's some question marks there, but it's a spectrum of risk type of situation if you're going to be relying on one of those. If you're sending data to a US entity under Privacy Shield, what you should be doing next is actually putting in place standard contractual clauses. We discussed the question about grace period, one of, uh, which, which came up earlier, and none has been formally declared yet, but we have seen the ICO's uh, benevolent guidance uh, in relation to that. Of course, we've also seen the Berlin less than a benevolent um, press statement in relation to, uh, to anything. Uh, involving Berlin companies. Um, so moving on then to uh, the next steps if you're relying on standard contractual clauses. Uh, so if you receive data under standard contractual clauses, you need to be thinking about how to reassure your exporter. They've got the main obligation, or they've got the only obligation to actually comply with European data protection law. But uh, And I know some of our clients are being proactive. They're issuing FAQs. Um, they're, they're, they're reassuring them. that They're, they're going to start doing stuff. People are starting to do stuff. Um, importantly, and it's a key point out of the agreement, my, uh, out of the decision which Michael mentioned, um, SEC should no longer be seen as a box ticking exercise. I, I, I'm, I'm a little, little bit more sanguine about how they've been treated. From, from my experience, US companies take contracts very seriously. They don't just sign them without being comfortable to a certain degree that they can actually comply with the standard contractual clauses. Um, some people do think they're box ticking, but anyway, certainly now they should not be a box ticking exercise. Do scrutinize the obligations as an importer to make sure that you can comply. Your customers would expect that. If you're sending data to understand the contractual clauses, then you need to go through the steps that Eleanor and Michael talked about. You know, is it a risky destination? Um, and, uh, and again, I want to reiterate, the court did not say, and there was a question on this, the court did not say just because it invalidated Privacy Shield, it did not say you can't use standard contractual clauses for the US. And they could have said that, but they did not say that. So you, you, do, a, you do assess, are you in scope of risky data? And if you are in scope of risky data, then you, um, uh, if data is risky for some reason, are there any additional supplementary measures that could be in place? We talked about additional contractual promises, perhaps about notification of law enforcement requests or, or a promise to resist it as, as strenuously as you can. You know, we're still thinking through these, some of these ideas and the, the, the whole community will be. Um, but, you know, contractual measures is, is one thing that's been left there hanging in the judgment. Um, policy review. Yeah, what is the policy of your receiving supplier? Um, when they've got your data, what will they do? Will they resist it? You know, what is that? Uh, and, and, you know, mention has been made, I think, by some commentators around you know, binding corporate rules and not touched by this. And binding corporate rules do have uh, a scrutinized, uh, regulator approved uh, way of dealing with law, uh, law enforcement requests. And regulators have proved BCRs with US companies involved in those transfers. They have. Um, and lastly, are there any technical measures that could be put in place? And there's not going to be suitable for everyone, but you know, for example, if you're using infrastructure as a service provider um, in the States, you know, encrypt data before it's out there, then you've taken an appropriate measure. There is absolutely no risk to privacy of individuals, even if it's still technically personal data. And lastly, and this is for everyone, and I'm on the hour, everyone watch carefully. You know, we after we rehearsed this morning or at lunchtime, 
we had the Berlin guidance. It's fast moving. A lot of regulators are going to be saying lots of things. We hope it will settle down with a with a level playing field. Um, and one of the messages here is that everyone's in the same boat. Um, it's a bit of a spanner in the works. We can understand why people are worried, but we are trying to reassure people there is a way to work through this. Um, as I say, whilst Privacy Shield is dead, uh, and yet yeah, by law immediately dead, it will be a de facto grace period, if not a formal one. Um, and standard contractual clauses survive for the US as they do for elsewhere. So thank you very much, everyone. Just to close then, um, we're repeating this on Monday. I'm so sorry, there were just so too many questions, uh, loads that I just couldn't deal with. We'll try and deal with some of them, if not all of them, in, in, in writing. Um, hopefully all of them. Um, we're repeating it on Monday. Uh, if co colleagues that you want to pass the invitation on to, they can make it today. We will be sending slides. Uh, we'll be sending a link to the recording very soon. Um, thank you very much for joining us, everyone. And, uh, and goodbye.